do please take a seat. And if we can have the first slide up, that would be great. And let me tell you about the story that goes about a, a conference some years ago. It was a conference on comparative religions, and experts were at it debating, it was a long time ago, they were debating what, if anything, was unique about the Christian faith. And there was much debate and head-scratching. Um, the incarnation was considered, but then thought, well, our other religions have spoken about God in human form. Uh, resurrection, maybe. Uh, but again, other religions had spoken about returns from death. And then at this conference, the great C.S. Lewis walked into the room and saw there was a and said, oh, what's all this rumpus about? Uh, and they asked, and they said, well, we were trying to fathom the unique contribution that Christianity has had to world religion. Oh, that's easy, Lewis responded. That's easy. What do you think he responded? It's grace. Grace. Amen, brother. <laughs> and his colleagues agreed, this notion of God's love coming to us, no strings attached, kind of goes against our human instinct and actually against other religious paths. The Buddhist path is eightfold. The Hindus have the doctrine of karma. There is the Jewish covenant. There's the Mus Muslim code of law. Only Christianity dares to make God's love unconditional. Grace. And so today we turn to track two of our, now that's what I call uh, Christmas music playlist album. And this time, Mary sings. And just before she starts singing, which is the reading that we've had, we see these words, Greetings, Mary, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. A little bit later, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. Luke wrote these words in Greek, and the English word that we get here translated as favour is the Greek word charis. A bit of quick research, and the word charis appears 136 times in the New Testament. So it's a really important word, a really important concept. But only six times is it translated as favour. The other 130 times... Charis is translated as grace. This picture of a gift. Something wonderful, yet free and unearned. And Mary is reflecting on the announcement of the most wonderful gift. And she sings, verse 46, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. But like last week, we want to just think about the story behind the song before we actually look at the story of the song. She didn't sing this song just randomly into a void. Before she launched into that first bar, there'd been an announcement, there'd been her life before, and, and a history that went far further back than this teenage girl. So let's remind ourselves of some very familiar words. And if you've attended a carol service or two over the years, uh, you'll know these words very well. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a name, man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. The most famous angel is sent to deliver one of the most famous messages. And against all the odds, it's to a poor teenage girl living in the back end of nowhere on the outskirts of the Roman Empire. Uh, but this wasn't a last-minute rush, last rushed affair. It was a day that had been coming, a day that was foreseen by the prophet Isaiah over 700 years earlier. I've looked at Isaiah once this morning. Here's Isaiah 7 and 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Isn't that incredible? Last week we were talking about that 400-year silence. And this year we have a prophet looking 700 years ahead and seeing a young girl, a virgin, about to miraculously give birth. You are highly favoured. 
Imagine, if you can, the expectation all through those years of the scholars and the rabbis. You're thinking, oh, imagine the picture of the one that will be so favoured, so blessed, the recipient of such grace. And then we're introduced to Mary. No one knows her, her parents. She's from the wrong place, a a local yokel. Why her? We don't really know that much about her, actually. She has a relation, Elizabeth. She comes up in a bit. She's young. She's poor. She's a devout believer. And she's in love. That's about it. She's pledged to Joseph. They were not married. They would not be living together at the time. They wouldn't have slept together. Uh, And all these announcements happen with that background story. And we need to kind of keep that in mind. It's difficult to do it, isn't it, really? A young girl, dizzy in love, living with her parents, anticipating the wedding feast. I mean, what's on her mind? I don't know. Her life with Joseph. You know, the dress, maybe. I don't know. Did they have posh dresses in? (laughs) The guest list. The food is also exciting. You know, girls in that situation and then all through history were near, near euphoria. And the guys were there probably saying, how much is all this going to cost? And into that backstory, this simple picture, God breaks in. Mary had to be part of something long promised, yet inconceivable. Something that, that will mean from this moment in your life, you'll never be the same again. Oh, you are highly favoured and the Lord will be with you. Uh, And what kind of greeting is this, she asks. That's her response, a fair enough response. And now those words, so famous again, you've heard them so many times. Let's see if you can hear them through Mary's ears. You're a teenager. Harder for some of you to remember than others. You're deeply in love. Your thoughts are not much more than about these exciting months ahead. You've got no clue what you're about to hear. And then you hear these words. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. You are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. (laughs) His kingdom will never end. Imagine that. She's not expecting that. And here's the question, you might think it's an odd one. In the light of this, do you view Mary as blessed? You know, do you think, oh, isn't she blessed? Do you think Mary saw herself as blessed as she heard those words? Because let's be real, in an instant, the dreams of that beautiful wedding, they're gone. All the hopes and the plans... You know, the quiet life of the man of her dreams in the home that she's added all her personal touches to, with a house of children maybe that she can bear and raise with loving care. It's gone. Gone. And more. In this culture, a teenage girl out of wedlock and pregnant was a scandal. The rumour mill would have been an overdrive. And more than that even, she's engaged to a guy and it's not him. He's not even the father. And we know, actually, don't we, that the, the rumours just go on for years. Even, even at Jesus' death. Was he a, one, of the, one of his the Roman soldiers, his dad. Oh, Mary, greatly blessed and highly favoured. Really? Yet this news means, in the core of her being, she's carrying God. She will give birth to the long-awaited Messiah. Verse 32, the Son of the Most High. And she would know that that means the Messiah. And verse 33, his kingdom will never end. That's from Isaiah's prophecy. She's no learned scholar. She doesn't need to be. She would know what that means. What a message to take in. And then this declaration, you have found favour with God. You found favour with God. Now let's be careful here, because I think we view words like that in a particular way, don't we? If someone looks on you favourably, it generally means someone 
normally with a level, some sort of level of authority over you probably, recognises a good quality or an achievement and some, or something earned. And they look on you favourably because of that. But remember where we started with C.S. Lewis in that dusty conference room? You are Caris, Mary, a recipient of grace, unmerited favour. This is about the greatest gift, not just for you. Here it is wrapped up, the Son of the Most High, the never-ending King for you. And it's a gift that's extended to us, friends. And maybe we say, do I deserve it? Well, no, that's the point. <laughs> Unmerited favour, amazing grace, what a gift, what a gift. I don't know if you've started your Christmas shopping yet. Maybe some of you have got them all wrapped up already. Anyone annoying like that? Got all? No way, I would not have put money on you. <laughs> Uh, mine tend to be a little bit later, not Christmas Eve, I'm not that bad, but you know, I normally get a pointed reminder from Oxana of all the ones I've forgotten, and it's a mad dash to the shops, and I tend to just look and see if they've got any panettones left on the shelves. Uh, that's a good present, isn't it? What should we get your sister? I'll oh, just get her a panettone. Hopefully she'll open it when we're there, when we get a slice. <laughs> uh, but this isn't, that, you know, this isn't a gift like that. Remember, it's preparation, generations before, generations in advance. And Mary, you will deliver that gift, highly favoured indeed. And at this point in Luke's gospel, things, very ordinary things mixed with extraordinary things. They're sort of interweaved, aren't they? Of course, the news that uh, a woman is going to have a baby is fairly ordinary. We've had dedications these last couple of weeks. We've got more bumps in the church family. But the manner of conceiving is quite extraordinary. Extraordinary too is the announcement Gabriel isn't called to do this too often, but very ordinary is Mary's response. What's her response? That she wants to go and talk to someone. And it's where our reading came in that Mary Elaine read. Verse 39, she visits Elizabeth, the wife of Zechariah, who of course was track one of our Christmas playlists last week. Two pregnant ladies catching up together. And what would be an ordinary discussion about, I don't know, the sex of the baby and colour schemes. Actually, I've no idea what an ordinary... I've never been a pregnant woman, so I don't know what an ordinary conversation would be. You get the point. But friends, what we witness is quite extraordinary. Have you ever considered that with these verses? We quite often skip past these verses, I think. The momentous thing that's happening in that room, the meeting of John the Baptist and Jesus the greatest of all the prophets since the beginning of the Old Testament, now meeting with the new. And if you think that's overstating John a little bit, it's actually what Jesus says about him later in Luke's Gospel. Luke 7 and 28, I tell you, among those born of woman, there is no one greater than John, says Jesus. He's the prophet above all. But friends, then he says something else. And it should make every Christian today gasp and say, could I really be that favoured? John, among those born of women, no one greater. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Hello? <laughs> is that an encouragement to you today? The, the one who has momentously screwed up it, the one who is in the kingdom but just hanging on on the tablecloth on that great feast. The greater. Why? Because of Jesus. Because of Christ alone. Because we get to be wrapped in his robes of righteousness. Hallelujah. The new has come. My oh, friends, no wonder as Mary gets this, she sings, My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. What grace. Friends, can you sing along to that today? Can you claim that for yourself? This grace gift that's held out, is it received? And so the story behind the song becomes the story of the song. 
and what content there is here. And the importance of the content really underlined by the way it is that she sings it. Mary doesn't sing these words because it's a bit of a tradition or because she's performing for some eager listeners. She sings because she's had an experience that's changed her. And here's a question for us. How do we feel as we sing? Maybe Christmas carols, maybe other songs. You know, when we sing a carol, do we sometimes just, I don't know, sing and get that warm Christmassy feeling? Is that what Christmas carol singing is for you? Now think of Mary. What does she feel as she sings? As we look at the words of the Magnificat, which simply means magnify, we see something very different from a, a warm, cosy, fuzzy feeling. We get someone transformed by the glorious truths that she sings about. Does it sound great, actually, that is? That the content of these carols that we've just started to sing, that we carry on singing, they hold within them something that can transform our lives. Words that do more than just make us feel Christmassy. And she sings with great humility. Look at 48, verse 48. God has been mindful of me. He's been mindful of me. He could have done the expected. He could have gone to a rich, noble woman in some palace, you know, up in Pease Lake maybe, you know, somewhere really posh. But you're mindful of me. Dictionary defines that as attentive, aware of, careful with. Imagine that, Lord, my spirit rejoices because you're aware of me. You're attentive to me. The world may look, may look down on me, but in his sight I'm valuable. And friends, that's not just for Mary. She sings of all generations being blessed. Verse 54, he has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful. That's the same word as mindful, by the way. Remember Psalm 8? When I consider your heavens, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. Maybe Mary sung that one actually, one of King David's playlist. And so her soul magnifies the Lord. Literally, my soul makes great, or my soul enlarges the Lord. Now, of course, you think that's weird, you can't make God any bigger, can you? But we can make him larger in our lives. We magnify or enlarge him when we meditate and take on some new aspect of his greatness. Keep your heart with all vigilance, says the proverb writer, for from it flows the spring of life. Friends, we're in a situation when we're in fear or suffering, maybe that's you today, and that thing looms large, but our experience of walking through it is not just about the thing, whatever it is, but it's about how we experience it as much to do really about the thoughts that capture our hearts. If we focus on the thing, it seems impossible. And the Lord is shrunk. He's demagnified. Mary could have done that actually. You know, go, oh, what a mess this is. What a mess. What's going to happen? But her soul is enlarged. Friends, what a wonder it is when we meditate on Christ born in our lives, his great sacrifice. By his spirit, his life flows in us and through us. We think greater thoughts than we could imagine. And they come through our lips and we magnify him and we're transformed. And look at some of what Mary ponders, if you like, that causes her and can cause us, I think, to magnify him. These verses just take us really to the character of God. That's what really transforms Mary. There's much here. Let's focus on these three areas that he is mighty, that he's holy, and he is merciful. She says, the mighty one has done great things for me. He has performed mighty deeds. But friends, do you believe in a, in a mighty God this morning? Or do you think, well, you know, yeah, I, I notionally believe in God. But intellectually, I've got some issues, so I'm limiting him. You know, I'm not sure he really is all-powerful. A God who is creator of all, God who is all-powerful, God who is born of a virgin, and we think, 
You know, can my modern mind cope with that? Actually, forget the modern mind. Mary also struggled with the concept, really. You know, me, a virgin, give birth to a son? Really? She wrestled with that, I'm sure. I mean, I think we can paint these characters so often as being a bit behind the times and so naive, they blindly just accept everything that we enlightened people and understand a bit more. But Mary wrestles with this unbelievable news while she goes and wants to talk to Elizabeth. But God is mighty, he's all-powerful. When we consider and sing of these events of the first Christmas, do we see them as a wonderful display of God's might? Or do we see them as you know, nice bedtime stories, which may actually have more of a, a metaphorical meaning than a literal meaning? You know, and if we think that, uh, we may sing of his might. We may say, yes, I believe up here he is mighty. I believe the concept of that. But in here, you don't really truly believe he's mighty. As Mary sings of his might, her spirit rejoices. He's a God of the impossible. What is impossible for man is possible for God. He turns all accepted norms on their head, morally, socially, spiritually. He scatters the proud. Those who think they have no need of charis, who think they've earned all that they need. Look at the reversals. He has brought down rulers and lifted the humble. All the great empires through history, they all crumble. At the time, they seem unassailable. The Syrians, the Babylonians, the Romans. But he brings down rulers and lifts the humble. Those who are humble enough to say, yeah, I've not got it all together. I need your help. They're lifted. Something of the gospel there, isn't there? And pause there, actually. I wonder if we do like that teaching. Those who are humble enough to say, I've not got it together, they're the ones that are lifted. Do you like the sound of that? I mean, we nod along. It sounds good, doesn't it? But we have got a little bit of a mantra that is deep in us that says, you know, maybe you know, God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> British, isn't it? God helps those who help themselves. That's actually not true. It's not a Bible verse that says that. Matthew 4, 74, God helps those who help themselves. He helps those who say, I can't help myself. I need you. You alone are mighty to save. Are we happy with that? It's amazing. Well, Mary rejoices. So should we. 53 is another reversal. The rich are sent away empty and the hungry filled with good things. And surely the rich are not empty, that's topsy-turvy. But we know that with great wealth, there can still be great emptiness. We certainly know that it can't buy your way out of death. And we need shaking from that confidence in our ability to thrive and produce and provide, because it's not long before we find that our identity is in those things. Friends, in our times of weakness, and maybe you do feel, for whatever reason, particularly weak and battered this morning, well, in there, there is a lived demonstration in your life of something that's always been true, that we are completely dependent on God for life and breath and everything else. It's always been there. It's just you realise the truth of it more in those weak times. So do you feel weak this morning? In a way, hallelujah. <laughs> you shouldn't be afraid of weakness. We should more fear our delusion of strength because st strong people don't generally reach out their arms for help. He alone is the mighty one. He's performed mighty deeds, we read, with his arms. Mary sings that. And in a, in a real physical sense, a tiny arm is being formed. In a few short months, it will reach out. And in the greatest display of power and might, in 33 years, those arms will be stretched out on the cross. The Saviour who does this precisely so that the humble and lowly can be lifted high. What might? She then sings, Holy is his name. That's the next one. 
Mary knows this because the angel says it back in verse 35. We started the reading later than that. The Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And when we sing of God's holiness, it's at the core, it's at the core of his very nature. It's his essence. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. God hates sin. He hates the greed and corruption and violence that we see was so prevalent today. Uh, and maybe actually we hate it too. We hate it. But we kind of get used to it. <laughs> we see it so much that it doesn't even shock us. Do you ever get that sense? You know, the things that are so shocking and you're not even shocked anymore. It's normal. You barely bat an eyelid. Maybe behaviour in, our, in ourselves that we excuse because in the grand scheme of things it was not that bad. We get used to it. Mary sings, God is holy. He never gets used to it. He never tolerates it. And at Christmas we see that he acts, he responds. And he doesn't send a moral code for us to abide by, a political manifesto for us to subscribe to. Everybody wants us to do that at the moment. He sends his son. The creator of the universe goes to such lengths to deal with our brokenness and he breaks into the world as a newborn baby. When we sing that first Christmas, do we see it like Mary as a wonderful display of God's holiness? And then because he is mighty and because he is holy, I'm so relieved that she sings of a third characteristic. She says his mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation, verse 50. If he were just mighty, uh, then the problem is that he could crush us. Uh, you know, of course, might on its own is not necessarily good news. There's plenty of examples of that through history. Uh, divorced from holiness and mercy, uh, it can be cruel. Think again of those mighty empires, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Romans. Uh, take your pick. Boy, they were mighty, very mighty, but not much in the way of holiness and mercy. So that might, might not be very good news. And if he was just holy, we might look at him and consider our lives and be just blown apart by guilt. In a sense of loss, if you like, that we could ever scale the heights of that complete holiness. But friends, here is the good news. The charis. He's also merciful. And we need the three together and we get it here in Jesus. It's what Mary sings. In a world where there's so often a shortage of grace and mercy, this is the best news ever. I've told you before about this wonderful, I read this, I must be ten, over 10 years ago, this wonderful golfing phrase. I'm not a golfer, but I did like this phrase called taking a mulligan. Um, some of you might have heard me talk about this before. It means that basically taking a mulligan means if you take it playing around with your friends and you scuff a shot up, uh, you can take a mulligan and try again. Isn't that amazing? You know, oh, sorry, I, oh, can I just have another go? Can I take a mulligan? Yeah, it's fine, take a mulligan. Uh, obviously, it's, that's at a non competitive level. Tiger Woods couldn't do that in the middle of the you know, championship, but you can take a mulligan. And you often think, oh, I'd, I'd love to be able to take a mulligan in other areas of my life. You, know, you get pulled over for speeding, maybe, and say to the officer, oh, you know, can I take a mulligan? You say, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. Mulligan, yeah, that's fine, yeah, no problem. Uh, or you make a comment about your wife's new hairdo, and as soon as you say, the words come out your mouth, think, oh, that didn't come out right, did it? So you quickly say, darling, can I take a mulligan? And she says, yeah, it's no problem. We'll forget you ever said such a dumb thing. It doesn't work like that, doesn't it, in the real world. But his mercy extends to the generations, for those who fear him, for the, those who acknowledge who he is and bow the knee to this newborn king, a kind of mulligan. Mary sings of his might, of his holiness, of his mercy, and we need all three. God, you are holy, and because he is, he is holy, he must do something to act in this broken world. He can't just let it slide. He can't just tolerate all our sin. But then, God, you are mighty. 
And because he is mighty, he can do something to act in this broken world. He alone can do it, the sinless saviour. And then amazingly, God, you are merciful. And because he's merciful, he wants to do something to act in this broken world. He cares, undeserved charis. Friends, we can listen to this original Christmas playlist. Now that's what I call Christmas. And we can nod and think, well, that's lovely and gives me a festive feeling of roasted chestnuts and the past. Or like Mary, you can consider his might and his holiness and his mercy. You can magnify him with your soul, with your lips, with your whole being. And you can say, my soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my saviour. And those words can change you for a lifetime. What favour, what grace. Let's pray together.